episode 46 with CEO of Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario yeah. with Alex Monta. Yeah, yeah, let's do this. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Quadro Caramante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does that even mean? Thank you, everybody, for listening. We got Teddy in the mix. We thought we're doing a show about the CEO of Children's Hospital of Ontario, Alex Munter, and the amazing innovations that they're doing, whether it's through COVID-19 initiatives or stuff that were predicated before. It's just, I'm so happy about this episode, but there's a lot to celebrate. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about our sponsor, the Better Together Project, put on by Haley Harlock. The event is July 9th, and this is an event for spouses of physicians and frontline healthcare staff and just a a way of supporting each other. It's a great event. We'll have links in the show notes, and if you sign up using the Solving Healthcare promo code, you will get 10% off. I'm going to be there. Kathy, my wife, is going to be there. Teddy, is it going to be epic? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be epic for real. So let me tell you about Alex Munter. I This was a really fun fo- podcast for us. And once again, it was all about how innovative the, the group at CHEO is in terms of um, managing issues around COVID and, and, and just doing what's best for the kids. Like whether that's virtual ER visits. Like Teddy, imagine you hurt yourself and you, instead of having to go to the hospital, you could go and talk to the doctor on the computer or on the phone. How cool would that be? That'd be epic. That would be epic, right, dog? Um, they they were they set up programs for respite for special needs kids uh, and families during uh, COVID nineteen task force for child abuse uh, victims, and it all stemmed by listening to the families, it's listening to the, the the care the care teams and the families and their needs. And I think this is such a beautiful premise. It's it's intuitive, but um, it, does, it doesn't always happen. So I was I'm really impressed by their approach. And just, we, we also talk about pedianomics, which is just the premise of how everyone benefits if we invest in our kids. And I love this concept. It's, it's something I'm a true backer of. Is those that listen to the show, we talk about how, you know, in a lot of ways, kids are everything. So... What do you think, Teddy? Should we introduce Alex? Should we get yeah. Alex Munter in the mix? So, yeah, without further ado, crew, Alex Munter. Munter. Ladies and gentlemen, Quadcast Nation, we have the CEO of Chio Hospital, Alex Munter. This is phenomenal. Thank you so much for joining us on the show, Alex. I've been waiting to get here for a long time, yes. so it's, it's good to see yes. you. Yes, it's good to see you too. I know we were trying to connect pre-COVID, but you know, a pandemic happened. We were going to have coffee, so I, exactly, that's exactly. Not allowed right now. A hundred percent. But I'm really. I just going to st- say straight up. I am so proud of some of the COVID initiatives Chio has has uh, implemented, and maybe we could just speak in general terms how your hospital has approached this global pandemic? So, uh, so thanks. And, um, you know, I think there are a couple of things to recognize, first of all, about COVID and kids, right? So uh, thankfully, you know, the burden of severe illness from COVID has not hit kids. And so, you know, the, the conversation, and when we look at the impacts on kids, they've been a little different than with the older members of our community that have been so hard hit by the tragedy and long-term care and and by severe illness related to the virus. But the impact of COVID on kids has been enormous. Huge. And the impact of the measures we've had to take as a society 
on kids. It's really great. If you think about kids having lost school, daycare, mm. friends, relatives, and the impacts on their development and health, these are significant. Mm. Uh, and so as we embarked on the pandemic, uh, we have participated with the rest of the region in responding. And so we have dozens and dozens and dozens of CHEO staff that are in long-term care centers on a humanitarian mission to help with uh, the, the tragedy there. Uh, we have supported uh, assessment centers, work in congregate care, really mobilizing to, to support the, the region-wide response. But we've also had our eye on the ball in terms of impact on kids and families. And so one of the things that became immediately apparent at CHEO and at all hospitals across the country, across the world, is that people were staying away from hospital. Mm. Uh, and people were staying away from hospital uh, because they were scared of coming to hospital. And so, you know, in, in 2019, so the first six months of 2019, we were over capacity at CHEO two of every three days. No hospital in Ottawa ran over occupancy as much as we did in the first half of 2019. A year later, so we're, it's March 2020, an emergency department that uh, you know, a year previous might have been seeing 250 or 300 kids was seeing 40 or 50. So we really started to worry about the kids we're not seeing. And so, you know, we did a lot of communications around the safety of our emergency department and the measures that we take in to keep it safe. But we also started to accelerate work that had already been underway in terms of virtual care. Uh, and so this has been a, a big focus for us, digital health, access to information. Uh, we were really one of the first hospitals in Canada to have an integrated electronic health record to try to push out um, patient portals. And, and we were on our way with virtual care and we had plans. And so really what the pandemic forced us to do was to accelerate those plans and, and whether that's virtual care for clinic visits or for, for example, our sleep, or, sleep disorder uh, monitoring. We took work that was already underway and, and, and accelerated it. But we also um, had some, you know, kind of cooked up things that, you know, in ordinary course events probably would have taken us months of meetings to think about. And we did in a couple of weeks. And, and probably the most significant is our, emergent, our virtual emergency department. Yes. Yes. And we stood that up through the work of our uh, emergency physicians and our IT folks. We really within a couple of weeks and immediately began to, to meet, meet a niche. And, and really kind of validated the hypothesis because in those first couple of weeks, about one quarter of the virtual emergency department patients had to come in. Wow, wow. Uh, there was one resuscitation. There were uh, several admissions. And so that did kind of validate the hypothesis that there were people staying away who really should be coming in. That's But it also... Yeah, it is incredible. And it also, it also showed that for some, you know, for some families, this is actually, those that don't need to come in, this is actually a very valid way to get care. Uh, and it's something we want to think about how we operationalize this post-pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I just got a note from um, a mom a few days ago and the issue was um, uh, reaction to medication, uh, and and it was an issue that was being was able to you know she was very very concerned about the symptoms her child was was exhibiting, and through a virtual visit was able to to resolve um, the concern. So we can do some of that on a go forward basis. You know that that will be a great service for families. It will take some of the pressure off our emergency department which often is the most, the busiest pediatric emergency department uh, in the country. And we need to do that, um, of course, in a way that is really connected to primary care and community pediatricians. Because what we don't want is people coming to an emergency department when really they should be uh, able to get care from their family physician or their community pediatrician. And so that's one of the worries we have at the moment, of course, as we pull out of COVID is, you know, how can we support 
primary care, so family physicians, community pediatricians, community health centers, to be able to care for kids. Uh, and how can the government do that? Because one of the rate limiting factors of, at the moment, of course, is access to PPE uh, and support for them to be able to run their clinic. So we don't want we don't want to turn our emergency department into primary care. Uh, we want people to be able to have access to primary care. We want to think about how can CHEO backstop uh, and support uh, primary care physicians uh, to be able to, to 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 help these families. Wow. Uh, I mean, Alex, this is, it's incredible. Like if you think about that step, you know, I, I'm, I'm focusing on the emer- virtual emerge visits, like a quarter, 25% of those visits ended up with patients coming in. That's a lot. And, That's a lot. and I, certainly clinically from our perspective, we were seeing a lot of people coming in with late presentation, but you're like a measure like this, not only is it more efficient, it's more it's more convenient for many, but it's also like, it's a life-saving measure. Like it was, yeah. it was a, a measure that is like for these kids to be seen and to be able to say, Hey, you need to come into hospital. You actually, and you, as you mentioned, somewhere admitted there was a resuscitation that's saving lives. And what I'm also very proud of when I hear this is how adaptable and how how you guys just said, like, we're going to move forward. We're not going to get too caught up in the red tape. We're, you know, we're not going to be aiming for perfection, but this is a need and we're going to hustle and we're going to execute. And it's just a lot of my listeners have heard me say this. It's just something that often isn't really embraced in our medical culture. I, I don't know if you've found that as, as CEO, um, the ability to create change, if that's been, if you find that more difficult in this culture, but certainly at the bedside as a clinician, this is what, this is what it's, what it appears to be. Yeah. It's slow. Mm-hmm. It, it can be slow. Uh, and we have to navigate government funding and regulation and, you know, the complexity of our, our system, you know, the challenge is the wisdom to understand when you're facing resistance, resistance is data, right? And, and so when you're facing resistance, is it resistance because of clunky bureaucratic systems that aren't designed to solve the problems that people are facing? Like how much of the resistance is that and how much of the resistance is actually, it might be a bad idea and people are um, identifying gaps, right? And so you know, a bit of both. And, and, and as we try to make change in the system, we have to be able to tell the difference. You know, the pandemic, obviously, because it's an emergency, there's an openness to doing new and different things. There's also tools. We have tools that we don't usually have uh, in terms of our ability to redeploy staff and to, to make change happen more quickly. So let's, let's see how all of that evolves. What I've been really excited to see here at CHEO but across the child and youth health world is the sincere motivation of organizations and providers uh, to respond to what we're seeing on the ground and to, to stand up programs and services and solutions, some of which won't be needed anymore, mm-hmm. but all of which really have been about dealing with that, that issue we're seeing of the impact on kids. So a good example is immunization. Yes. So one of the things we don't want is to have outbreaks of vaccine preventable disease because children were unable to get their 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 vaccination. So again, we want people to 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 get their vaccines from public uh, from from primary care, excuse me, because we want that, you know, those well baby visits, the immunization visits are an opportunity for continuity of care for babies and toddlers with their primary care physicians. But not everybody has a primary care physician or not, not every primary care practice has been able to see patients due to the limitations on them uh, in terms of PPE and, and they've had to make difficult decisions. And so working with community pediatricians, with Ottawa Public Health, uh, and, let, and using our Kids Come First Health team, which is a partnership of, of health providers focused on, on kids and families across our region, we uh, stood up a, an immunization clinic. It's come first immunization clinic for babies and toddlers, for people who are not able to get their mandatory uh, vaccinations 
any other any other means, right? We saw that, so that's babies and toddlers. That's the kind of young end of our world. On the, the older end of our world, we saw with, with youth and, and young adults, we identified a gap early on. You know, if you or I were awaiting a test result for, for, for COVID-19, we would have a safe place to go to say self-isolate. If we tested positive and had mild illness, didn't need to be hospitalized, but had to self-isolate, we would have a place to go. But, you know, there's any given uh, night in Ottawa, there are several thousand youth and young adults who have no safe place to go. So what, where would they go uh, in the event of um, having to wait for a test result or testing positive? So we created, working again with public health, with Youth Services Bureau and the Kids Come First Partnership, an isolation center. Wow for uh, young people to go to either recover or wait for, for test results, right? Mm-hmm. We heard from families, so, you know, you've got, you've got three kids, I have one. It is difficult when there's nowhere for them to go. I, any parent can relate to this. So then imagine if your uh, child has uh, serious behavioral issues, has special needs, how much more difficult it is uh, when there are no supports, when the supports you rely on, informal supports through family and friends and and organizational supports through services from organizations like CHIO, all gone, all shut down kind of on a day day's notice on, in middle of March. So we have established uh, respite programs, in-home respite for uh, kids of medical complexity, working in partnership with home care organizations. And... Um, on site here at CHEO and a number of CHEO's other locations in, in Canada and Cornwall and elsewhere, on site respite for, for kids with special needs. So, you know, that's a, that's a response to, uh, to, the, to the pandemic as well. And again, looking at kind of impact on kids and families. Another area that was an immediate concern for us, of course, was kids that are at risk of neglect and abuse. So, mm-hmm. You know, sending kids home uh, for most kids, for the vast majority of kids, home is a safe place. But there's some kids for whom it's not. And what immediately happened as soon as the caring eyes of teachers and early childhood educators and daycares, Coaches. neighbors went away, mm-hmm. was that referrals to Children's Aid dropped by 50%. Mm-hmm. And emergency department visits to CHEO draw child protection. And so huge worry about that. And so we mobilized resources uh, with police, with CAS uh, here at CHEO to do a couple of things. One is to, there's a daily triage meeting and a much better, much closer collect, uh, connection. We've re- realigned some nurse practitioner time to our child and youth protection clinic trying to put resources in place to support parents working with, uh, with CAS, because this is a group of kids that we are deeply worried about in this pandemic. So those are some of the things that we've, we've done to try to respond to the impact on, on kids and families uh, during COVID. Uh, and many of them, you know, I've mentioned the Kids Come First Health team a number of times. That's, that's a partnership we spent the last year building with about 60 organizations across Eastern Ontario, the largest mobilization ever of child and youth health providers in this region organized together to try to respond to the needs of of kids. This is not what we had in mind. These were not projects on our list, but having done the work for a year of bringing people together, when the pandemic hit, we were uh, well positioned to respond. Well, Alex, so many comments here, but number one, yeah, we'll get back to the Kids Come First because I, I love that initiative. But just the fact of, you know, you guys thinking ahead, like thinking like, hey, you know, these kids are at risk of not getting vaccinated. Like one of the things that we talk about a lot on the show is the secondary co- issues of COVID. And, and when you bring up some of these issues, a lot of people, it's not obvious to people, like knowing that kids might not be getting vac- vaccinated because they're afraid to get to the to the, their clinic or might not have access to their primary care clinic. So just being ahead of the game and thinking, you know what, we don't want our kids to get sick from preventable illness. It's like spot on. We yeah, So I don't want to disagree with you. Like you can keep 
going on about how brilliant we are, but we're not actually that brilliant because because <laughs> all we all we did really was listen to families. So so that idea actually how that started mm. uh, and this kind of you know we talk a lot about the nefarious impact of social media on our society and there certainly is a lot of uh, are you listening Mark Zuckerberg like a lot of bad stuff that Facebook and others are are responsible for but the connections of social media also can be really powerful so so here's how that happened I tweeted something I want to say at the end of March, but the time is all blurring together into this big, massive COVID time. So maybe end of March, beginning of April. Anyway, um, I tweeted something about some kind of benign tweet about don't forget to get your child to vaccinate, you know, your vaccinations for your kid. And I got a bunch of responses from people I tried, but I can't. Wow. Uh, I, you know, like the, my clinic is closed or they're, they're open, but they're not doing that. And so then we uh, start to have conversations to try to, you know, is that actually, you know, is that kind of isolated or is that how big, how big a problem is it? So we started talking to the community pediatricians in particular, uh, started uh, talking to public health. Public health then confirmed that they had the the because the, they they do the distribution of the vaccines uh they confirmed that there'd been a, I, f- I forget the figure now i want to say 30 40 50 percent decrease but I, I don't remember the exact figure of uh, vaccines that they distributed and so so then we built a bit of a plan and then a couple of weeks later we launched it and the the day it was launched uh and the contact you know the contact information was released in the media the next day the clinic was full was all booked wow. up. So, but where that started, so just just to say that that did not start that that was not somebody sitting in a in a hospital or a doctor's office being brilliant. It was listening to it was being brilliant by listening to families. But that's that's it, part of the brilliance. It's like I well, that's at the core of it. The core of it is that has to be whether it's here or anywhere else. That's what we have to be rooted in. And I would say. The respite, sir, the in-home respite and the, the on-site respite, same thing. I mean, that's, that's because that's what we heard from, uh, from families as, as, being, uh, as being a gap. So I, I always think that the, the closer we can stay connected with families, with the users of the system, the better our services will be, uh, 100%. the relevant they will be, uh, and, that, and, and, you know, that, that our ability to listen is, is, is the fundamental thing, right? But, but you, you and I both know this doesn't always happen. This is not a, this is it. I mean, this is why I'm commending you so much is because you, you are listening. And, you know, as a guy that um, I'm almost embarrassed to say, but I probably undervalued the patient experience in terms of whether it's my research or doing clinical stuff. Like I, it is so important. And it's probably one of the best lessons of doing this show actually so far is hearing the stories from the patients and hearing what matters to them and how what we do can impact them. And so I, I'm here to say that not all organizations, not all governments listen truly to what the patients are saying. And the fact that you guys not only listen, but like execute it. You know what I mean? Like the respite. Like I, I have um, a nephew that's... Um, you know, that's physically challenged, mentally challenged. And, and I know, like they're in Alberta, I know how much this, the COVID has impacted their lives. And, and they're fortunate to have jobs where, you know, they, they're able to be st- still be functional, but like not everyone has that gift. And, you know, like, and just knowing, just being cognizant, hey, our CAS calls are, are less, like um, the abuse cases we're seeing in Emerge is less. So like, we need to think about outside the box. We had um, Michelle Ward on the show a couple of weeks yeah, back. So Michelle is a oh remarkable, my God. remarkable leader. Yeah. She, I, I, I was saying like, she's just a, a junior angel. Like I, I want to reach across from the, the, the screen and give her a monster hug. But um, I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe um, how adoptable in you and how quickly you guys were able to, to just maneuver and say, how, how can we reach out to our people? And provide them with better care. It's 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 beautiful, it really is. Um, well, and and I mean, you mentioned Michelle. We have a lot of Michelles here, and as as do all organizations. And and so I, you know, I think it is, 
you know, that partnership of clinicians who have expertise, who care, families who bring knowledge that only they will have uh, and be able to express the needs that are, that are most pressing. It's that, you know, it's when we can get that partnership going that, um, you know, I think we can do magic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I, one of the unintended, for me, one of the unintended or not unintended or unanticipated learnings around COVID have, have come out of our engagement with long-term care. Mm-hmm. Because obviously that's, you know, not part of our service system and it's not a clientele that we would uh, normally see. But one of the things that uh, I think went wrong there is I don't, it's not, n- not that it was a mistake. I'm not saying it was a mistake at all. It was a necessary thing to do. But taking families out of long-term care removed helping hands and watchful eyes. and. Helping hands and watchful eyes are uh, really important in the delivery of healthcare. And I would say that, you know, hospitals are much better resourced than, uh, than long-term care centers. But I would say care is, I'll just speak about our organization, care is better when family is here. When parents are here, parents, parents have knowledge about their kids and knowledge about their kids' condition. They advocate and they help. And, um, you know, I, I think one of the, one of, for me, this really has reinforced how crucial it is to have, in our context, parents and caregivers, but family members, just more broadly in the healthcare system, family members, really family members are part of the care team. And when they're not present, that has an impact on the quality of care. And it has an impact on the outcomes of care. And I think we've seen that in the most tragic way in long-term care, but it plays out in, in much less dramatic ways, I think, in all, in all patient interactions. We took um, the decision early, early on when the no visitor policy was uh, directed. We just decided that parents are not visitors. Um, so we have a no visitor policy, but parents or caregivers are not are not visitors, right? Because parents are part of the care team. So I think, you know, I, I think there's, we've all been go, we've all been working at the speed of COVID for the last 90 days. And so, you know, there hasn't been a lot of time for reflection and analysis of, you know, what went right, what went wrong, what would we do differently? Um, we don't have the luxury of a lot of time because of the second wave coming. Uh, we need to, as always, uh, hope for the best and plan for the worst. But you know, we, we need to kind of do some quick learnings on what we've just done. And, and I don't know. So if there is a second wave, if and when there's a second wave, I don't know that we can shut down the whole healthcare system again. I don't think so. The latent demand that that is going to generate. Uh, and so in our world, ramping down has, you know, very serious consequences for the the health and well-being of kids for their development. So if we're talking about kids getting, you know, if I think about the, you know, remember CHIO is two-thirds acute, one-third community-based services. If I think about therapies, occupational therapy, speech language therapy, behavioral therapy, uh, when you think about surgery, uh, getting eye surgery because you, your kids you can't see, or even tonsillectomy for an ongoing problem that is causing you a child distress. I mean, these are these have impacts on kids' growth and development, right? We're and, not talking about it enough. We're yeah. not talking about it enough. Like you said, I think we can do this again. Like I think a lot of what we our reaction was and justfully justifiably was based on fear. And like we didn't want to be another Italy or, or New York. And so, yes, we didn't allow visitors. Yes, uh, you know, families weren't part of care teams. But we need to learn, as you said. Like this, it's, we still got to keep that human side. We still have to connect. Like, we, like and we, we still got to think about this, the secondary consequences of our actions. Kids, and like kids not getting what they need to develop. Like, I feel like their voices at times aren't being heard, you know. 
So I can't agree with you more, Alex. I just, I mean, my bias, I, I don't know about, I don't know what this second wave will look like or what, what have you, but we can't, it can't look the same as far as I'm concerned, where we lock down everything. Because then this is, I honestly don't feel that we are, that conversation of what those wait times mean, like the, the kids waiting for surgeries, like I, I, pediatrics, I, I, it's not a world that I totally comprehend, but adult world, like you went for your hip, you went for your semi-elective procedure, now it's an a, a urgent procedure. Like it's just, it's a, it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous road. As far it's as I'm such concerned. a, um, I've always, you know, I was, you know, it's, it's health system language that I, it's, it's one of those places where health system language is, you know, kind of a miss. Is anybody really elective? Who's having exactly. elective surgery? Exactly. Like, you it's know, a maybe, bad word. You know, maybe a nose job is elective surgery. But when we're talking about, you know, eye surgery for kids, and yeah, our bureaucratic definition classification system makes it elective. Nobody thinks the surgery they are getting in the public hospital in Problems Ontario is elective, right? Mm. And, you know, just in, in, and so there's, of course, surgical procedures, diagnostic procedures, right? Uh, so, so the, the, we've had in this region, just this region, nearly 100,000 diagnostic imaging, medical imaging procedures uh, that were scheduled and canceled in this kind of May to, to June period. So even just recovering that, which is uh, often, as you, as you know well, kind of the, the, the early part of the trajectory towards other intervention, you know, is going to be tough. And so part of the so yeah, you're right. We got to figure out a way to be more functional during a second wave than we were last time. The risk, the original risk remains. You're, you're right. We were we were transfixed. I was transfixed. We were all transfixed by what we we're seeing out of New York City and Italy and elsewhere. But here's the thing that you know I don't think the public really ever understood in terms of the motivation in the healthcare system. Here's what we know. We know that. New York and Italy, as examples of Spain, have way, way more capacity than we do. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, Italy has, uh, I want to say twice, it's approximately twice the number of acute care hospital beds per capita as Ontario. Spain has 70% more acute care hospital beds than Ontario. Germany has four times more acute care hospital beds. In Germany, than, than, than Ontario. Uh, New York has 100 hospitals, you know, for a pop population. Uh, New York City, 100 uh, hospitals for a population half the size of Ontario's. So one of the, the, one of the things that we were all worried about was there was just no way our system, after years of austerity, had the kind of capacity to be able to absorb what was happening there. And that, that risk will, you know, continue to be the the case and and we have to figure out how to rebuild our 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 capacity uh, but that's not something that can happen between now and and another wave right yeah but some of the stuff you're doing is building capacity though like yeah. the, the like i know it's not it's not um groundbreaking or but like the fact that we are seeing more patients virtually the fact that you know we could be addressing some of their needs earlier See, addressing needs in the community, all these steps have an impact. I do hear you. Like our hospital was, I don't know how often, I don't have the stats in front of me, but we're almost always at 100% capacity. It was pretty incredible to see how quickly the hospital could really increase the capacity though. Like, you know, the impact of stopping elective procedures and, and ultimately the fear of COVID, I think, more patients weren't coming into hospital like we were relatively empty but yeah yeah, yeah i mean now, it's and 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 now what's happened of course is um because admissions to long-term care have been closed the in what in our world we call the adult hospitals yeah. the uh the the adult hospitals now are full again mm. and they're full of record numbers of frail elderly who are post acute who don't need an acute care hospital anymore, but have nowhere else to go. And so, and then that problem, which is, you know, not a new problem is kind of back to being the daily operational reality of uh, so many of our hospitals locally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, 
unfortunately doesn't have an easy fix. But uh, um, well, it's not an easy fix, but it's not a complicated fix, right? You know, b- you know, building capacity is a question of of will. So why why did Germany and Spain, with relatively at one point in the pandemic, they I think were had the exact same number of cases, almost exact same number of cases. Why did one have a significantly higher death rate than the other, right? And Germany has invested. Ger- Germany is a country that, from a wealth perspective, is not that much different than Canada. Right. It's a little bit wealthier or a little bit less wealthy, depending which way you want to count wealth. But it's a comparable country to ours on a per capita basis. And they've got four times as many uh, acute uh, care hospital beds. They have far more lab capacity than we do and are able to execute a testing strategy in a way that saluted us. They have massive investment in, in public health and community services. Those are choices they've made. Those are choices they made as a society to invest in that service system when we have not made those choices. So at the end of the day, yeah, increasing the capacity of long-term care, building community services, intervening earlier with kids, those are, those are all things that kind of we know how to do. We just haven't necessarily collective, collectively made the choice to do them. Just haven't prioritized them. Yeah, it's interesting points you make about... Germany, I, I need to dive into it deeper. Like, like I wonder if they're more efficient with their money. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I wonder if they're, if they, how much they spend on healthcare per capita or, or whatever metric you, you use is it, similar. It, it's, yeah, so it's not that, dis, I mean, Canada, as you know, is kind of in the middle of the pack for what we, what we spend and often at the bottom of the pack in terms of what we get. The difference, I think, is... In Germany, as an example, uh, but really across all of Western Europe, th- their investments in non-health services that uh, drive health outcomes are are much greater. So the social spending, mm. spending in areas like housing and education and childcare, those are those are areas where they have greater investment, and so they have. There's, there's health outcomes for that, right? Mm-hmm. The other thing, you know, and I would, would, would see this in what, you know, health-related services. So all these countries have pharmacare. All these, almost all these countries include dental care mm-hmm. um, as, as part of their system. And long ter- long-term care is much better supported. And so, you know, I, you know, I, you know I, I do think it is about the choices we make the amount of taxes we're willing to pay, all of those things come together in you know, what we are able to do together um, as a society in terms of taking care of each other. Yeah, and it, it ties in well to, to um, you know, we talked a lot about social determinants of health and, and how that can impact long-term outcomes. And, I'm gonna, and I, short-term I, outcomes. And short-term outcomes, of course. Yeah. And um, you talk a lot about I'm gonna screw up and screw up this word. I know it's a made-up word. Pedonomics. 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 Yeah. And the realities of investing in kids. And yeah. so I, I'm wondering if you could, like, how you came about this, or, or just maybe elaborate on that um, a bit, Alex. Sure. Uh, so pedonomics is the economics of investing in pediatrics, right? Right. And um, you know, so there's a myth. And it's, it's kind of a, a myth that is demeaning to our parents and grandparents. And it's the myth is this, this like silver tsunami of old people is going to kind of overwhelm our healthcare system. You even hear it like in the current, in the current debate, right? And um, I mean, that's just rude, you know, comparing our elders to a natural disaster. A tsunami also, by the way, is... Uh, sudden and unexpected, and aging is neither of those things. And so, in fact, when you look at what we spend money on in the healthcare system, two of every three dollars we spend in the kind of organized healthcare system is for the management of chronic disease. And we we can't prevent people from getting old, 
But if we're smart about it, we can actually prevent people from getting chronic disease or we can delay the onset of chronic. And if we do that, if we, if we can reduce chronic disease in this country, then we can shake loose more than enough money to make sure that we have the dollars we need to invest in, in long-term care and other services for, for older folks. And so what's one of the best ways to reduce chronic disease? Well, it's to put kids on the path to lifelong health. And so if you look at even, even not, you know, even very modest. So if you were to in reduce preterm birth, improve uh, outcomes for child and youth mental health, reduce childhood obesity. And I'm not talking about eliminate any of those things, but if you were to make us uh, dent. an appreciable dent in any of those areas or all of those areas together, wow, like you would really, you would shake loose a ton of dollars in the, uh, in the system and in, in terms of, um, and just the health system in terms of utilization later. And in the, in, the, in the nearer term, you, you obviously you would have healthier kids and healthier uh, young adults. Uh, you would be delivering the promise of a better future to kids that they deserve. But also you'd have more taxpayers and innovators and workers in the economy and all of those things, right? And so that's the essential argument. And it, you know, it was interesting to me a couple of years ago, so it would have been probably 2017, uh, the results of the the data from the 2016 census were released, and the headlines everywhere. The headlines everywhere were for the first time in Canadian history, there were more seniors than there were kids. And true, it's numbers, and so you know, gave rise to a whole bunch of those silver tsunami and you know, the gray-haired menace and all of that kind of media coverage. And nowhere, nowhere, like literally nowhere in the media coverage was uh, included the fact that the child and youth population is actually growing. That 20 years from now, there'll be 1.2 million more kids than there are today. So we have all the same number of kids we have today, plus 1.2, that's like the entire province of Manitoba just of kids, mm -hmm. in addition to the kids we have now. So in fact, that is unlike a place like Italy, that is, in fact, one of the great assets that we have in Canada to deal with an aging population, which is that our child and youth population is growing. And that's a resource. That's a resource. These are the caregivers and innovators and taxpayers of tomorrow. They're the ones that will be fueling the economy and taking care of our older um, citizens. So if you're really, you know, focused on the kind of aging of the society, then one of the smartest things you can do is to invest in kids because we have a growing, a growing um, pool of growing population of children and youth. And, you know, I am um, not to make all my, you know, data points reference social media, but I, I tweeted one of these articles about this at one point. Somebody responded and said, now, why the hell are we training pediatricians? We should be training geriatricians, right? And, you know, I can tell you, CHEO, we don't have enough pediatricians, or I should say pediatric, pediatric physicians. So, for example, it took us years, took us seven years, seven years to fully staff our child and adolescent psychiatry position. They're fully funded. It was not a money problem. We just couldn't find people, right? With Developmental events probably, too. Sorry? With increasing demands, probably, Yeah, too. absolutely. Same with developmental pediatrics. So the folks that are kind of on the front line of, of issues around development, those positions can sit vacant for years. Uh, again, fully funded. Like, we've got the money. We just can't find the people. So when I hear, well, you know, we need to spend less on pediatrics, ludicrous, right? We, we're going to need more schools. We're going to need more child care centers. We're going to need more investment in child and youth health because there's going to be more kids than there are now. And... The business case for that, pedianomics, is that that is not competition to the needs of seniors. That is part of the solution to help support the needs of seniors in the future. And so that's kind of the link we, uh, the link we need to make here. And you know what? This is a rich and blessed country. 
And we are able, if we want to, we are able to take care of kids and take care of seniors at the same time. We don't need to pit them against each other. 100%. I, I, just, I just, once again, I wish, I just don't feel like the kids have a loud enough voice. Like, you know, I, I, by well, voice, I mean, often, right? Yeah, the, it's just, it's just not discussions, right? Yeah, it's just not prioritized enough. And for all the points you've mentioned, and you know what, what makes me sad too is just, I think about all the important factors you've mentioned about being physically active for chronic disease, mental health, all this stuff is being kind of sacrificed right now during this epidemic. And, and I, I mean, you're definitely, you got advocacy here. We, we had a child psychologist on uh, Adrian Matheson talking about how, you know, even early interventions can have like these lifelong impacts on these kids. And when you think about the investment, like to have a, a proper assessment, if you don't have insurance coverage is like $3,000 in this country. And, and the work they do to be able to impact not only fam- the kids, but the families, because it's, it's a, really a family issue. It's just insane. And I, I mean, all these things, not only if you think about it, investing in the kids, getting them healthier and mental, uh, assisting with mental health, like it helped. The thing is, it helps us all. It helps the family. It helps, as you mentioned, the, the aging population. It's, it's just, we just need that foresight. We just need that voice. We need that emphasis to be on, hey, the kids matter, you know, and um, I don't know what it, I don't know what it'll take. I, I just think maybe more conversations like we're having now, getting people to think up outside the box a little bit in terms of why this is so important. Or and sometimes I think it's a little bit of trickery too. Like, you know, maybe we make our cities more walkable so we all get healthier, but, you know, realizing it's also better for the kids. And, I, you know, I don't know what it'll take, but it's to me and it, the likes of yourselves, it's, it really is just, it's too important. It really is. Well, we need to build a movement, right? Amen. We need to change the boogies like we like to call it on the show. The other thing, while I have you, kids come first. We've alluded to it a couple mm-hmm. of times, but just as, as clear as possible, you mentioned it's multiple community groups within, within the region, but just once again, and if it's... So, yeah, sure, I'm going to thumbnail sketch. So uh, in early 2019, the government of Ontario announced its um, Ontario Health Teams initiative, and really which was about bringing groups of providers together to take care of a population. So we'd already been talking about that in this region. We, uh, back in 2017, we put out something called Thrive, which was, uh, which looked at the health needs of the 250,000 kids in, in Eastern Ontario, where the gaps were, what the anticipated future demand was going to be. We, so we had a bit of a blueprint about what we need, wanted to do together as a region to improve child and youth health. So when the government made this announcement, um, we said, well, hey, that's, that's us. So as the process continued, Ontario Health Teams, that particular brand became a little more specific about a geography and um, a lifespan type of mandate. And, but we kept going. And so by the end of the year, the, the, the Minister of Health announced that uh, the Kids Come First Health Team would be part of the new system be a little different than most of the other health teams because it, it would deal with a population of kids as opposed to only a, in a geography, but as opposed to a, a geographic focus. And through the course of 2019, we, we built this partnership of, of healthcare organizations, 60 organizations from across the region, about a thousand physicians that have signed on to, to support. And we, identified as our first kind of three priority areas for for intervention, mental health and addictions, and really responding there, the needs of kids with with medical uh, complexity, which is a smaller number, but with deep need, and then immunization, uh, and really trying to drive immunization for for all children. Those are the three areas of, of focus. And then, of course, then the pandemic arrived. And so some of that work, immunization, good example, some of that work we've been able to, and some of those partnerships, we've been able to apply to, to 
the current health crisis, and it's led to some of the uh, initiatives and projects that you uh, that we've been talking about today. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's you know the the idea being let's look at what the needs of kids are. They are unique. The kids the you know not only are our kids uh, health needs different, and there's that layer of developmental impact and how we affect the life trajectory by by the resources we provide kids, but also the way in which we deliver services is different. So parents, schools, child welfare, the the whole ecology of children's lives is different. You know, and the example I always use is the mental health system. So on the adult side, in terms of adult mental health services, the key partner for the adult mental health providers is the housing sector. Because if you can't have safe and secure housing, it's going to undermine your ability to have a recovery from mental health and addictions. So housing and mental health have to work like this. In our world, in the child and youth world, uh, there absolutely is a, is, is a piece of the population. We talked about it earlier, the, the several thousand kids, um, uh, street-involved youth, and, and those at risk of, of homelessness. So there's for sure housing for young people is, is a component. But our key partner is the education system. That's where most kids are most of the time. And so uh, the child needs mental health system needs to work with the education system, right? And so that's why we need to think about kids as a, as a population, not as a service line or a medical specialty. Kids are a population. Uh, kids and families need a service system that's built around their unique needs so their kids can thrive. And that's what Kids Come First is all about. Beautiful. So it's like less siloed is what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing. Yeah. So it's for example, like, yeah. So if I take the mental health and addictions uh, work, or here's the vision. We've brought together pretty much every single child and youth mental health agency across the region. There's, uh, there's about 20. Our vision is a one call, one click uh, access point. Yes. Um, but then behind that, because then that's really just a, fr- that's just a door. And there's no point building a golden door if when people open it, there's nothing behind it. So behind that, then, the vision is for us to be able as organizations to work interoperably, which is not what happens now, so that kids can move between our services and can get what they need much more easily than is the case now. And that families, what we expect families in crisis to do is to kind of go around to all these organizations and, and, and get what they need. And so if we, can, if we can do that work, the system can take that work of, of figuring out, you know, how do we pool our resources? First of all, we need we do need more resources in the child and youth mental health space. That is, that you know, we can only reorganize what we got to to a certain extent. There there needs to be investment there. But can we divert kids from the emergency department to other services? Can we can we connect mental health and addictions services much more closely? And so, can we could, for example. Uh, a child be admitted from our emergency department into another residential facility right away, as opposed to the way it has to happen now. When uh, a referral comes in, if the best provider to 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 provide support is actually at Centre Psychosocial or at Crossroads Children's Center, not at Chio, can the referral come to Chio, but the care take place at one of those locations? Right. So, so I think it's those that it's. That's the plumbing, and we never really should talk about the plumbing. It's, it's the outcomes that matter. But our, our vision is really one call, one click, you get what you need in terms of uh, child and youth mental health services. Can you imagine? This is a way help. I mean, we can imagine. We can yeah. imagine, and we have a plan, and it's been slowed down a bit. So we've tried to leverage some of that for responding to the pandemic. But we are worried about a pandemic after the pandemic, right? And, and that will be mental health. And I think all of us, over the past uh, three months have had rough days, felt uh, discouraged or dejected about where things are at. So imagine if you don't have supports you need, home isn't a safe place, you're feeling hopeless, you know? I mean, those are the conditions for, for, for mental illness to, to flourish. Um, mm-hmm. And so we, we do need to be equipped to respond as a system and as a community. 
Yeah. And that's why it's important to have conversations like this. Just uh, once again, encourage thinking outside the box and to address these needs out in the communities. But Alex, I got to tell you, this has been spectacular. We covered a lot here and, and just, yeah, I mean, I got to tell you, it left me even more inspired to be able to, you know, have that patient-centered approach. What's what's best for our, our our patients and our families, and really make sure they have that voice and to and do our best to execute on their needs. Like, is this is what it, this is why we got into this game? This is why you and I so, got into so, this game, buddy. So why are you a pediatrician? You'd be an awesome pediatrician. Do you know what? It's funny you said that. I my whole med school, I was aiming to be a pediatric intensivist, and I just couldn't deal with the. I just found everyone a little bit more wound up than in adult life. There was a lot more intensity. There was, whether that's the parents, whether that was the the care teams, it was just, you could feel that there was a lot at stake, which there was, There's, you know, it's kids' lives. But at that point, I just felt it was just a, a bit, my personality didn't seem to match the environment. So where did you, where did you train? I am from University of Alberta. I'm from Edmonton originally. So you would have been, you would have been installing. Yeah, like installing. Installer, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I did some work in IWK too. I did a, a electives out there and did some work in uh, <laughs> hemo oncology. And, and it was just after that where it was, you know, I'm like this, like maybe they, my personality would be helpful here, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be well embraced. So I ended up nah. going to the adult world and, uh, but um, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I, like, I mean, I, you don't know me, but I love kids. Like kids are, they bring a lot of joy to uh, our world. And I, I, w- I probably would have had more kids if, uh, if, uh, if we started earlier, but, um, but yeah, it's, um, but I definitely hear you. That's why I got a soft spot for this. Wow. Stuff. So I'll, I'll, I've, I've got to go to, uh, I have a 12 o'clock, so I've got to go to that. But um I'll, I'll give some thought to how we can lure you into the child world somehow. <laughs> hey, I'm always, I'm, I'm, I like to keep, keep an open mind, my friend. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much for doing Great this. Great to meet and you this way. And hopefully we'll do it in person sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you everybody for listening to that episode with Alex Munter, episode 46. That was tweet. Um, for those that want to leave comments, please do so at quadcast99 at gmail.com. Follow us on Insta, Twitter, YouTube at Quadcast. Please, please, if you love the show, give a five-star rating. Tell a friend. Check out our merchandise. All the all the proceeds go to supporting local charities. This year, this week, this month, it's Bridges Over Barriers. So we really appreciate uh, any support there. Thanks so much to our, our team that it continues to help out with content, whether it's the show notes, whether it's social media posts. We love you. And on behalf of Teddy. Yeah. And, and please my, leave some subscribes and some likes because we really want those. <laughs> okay. We know, what, how do you even know what that means? Anyway, thanks so much for listening, guys. And we'll, we'll uh, talk soon. <laughs> You're hilarious. <laughs>